And BGP is there to help. <laughs> hey, BGP is there to help. BGP in space. Yeah. Hey, greetings, fellow nerds, and welcome to another episode of Between Two Nerds. I'm Jeff Doyle, and with me, as always, is my friend and co-host, Jeff Tansura. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Great to see you. It's been Great a month you. since yeah. we met. And yeah, you look we were... healthier and younger every time we meet, so <laughs> way to go. I'm living backwards. <laughs> Yeah, and and I haven't even been uh, on vacation lately like you have. So, um, did you enjoy Mexico? I did, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, it was just Mexico City. Just yeah. Mexico. Oh, okay. So, so, not you know, we weren't enjoying beach life or anything like that. Huh? Oh no, no, I'm I'm not a beach person. I'm a city person. So we went to see pyramids and. Uh, some museums and oh man i'd food. love to go to mexico city and just spend the whole time eating street tacos it's pretty simple actually flight yes. is a few hours and time difference is not significant enough to call jet lag so highly yeah. recommend it i was only in mexico city once but I, it was for work and i was busy the whole time so didn't get to be a tourist at all but uh would love to do that sometime uh, so anyway, our um, our show today is on the state of network operations and uh, sorry, the network uh, automation. And as I put in as kind of a subtitle, you know, we want to look at some drivers and blockers. And uh, our guest today is Chris Gun uh, Grundeman. And Chris, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on, uh, both of you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You want to tell uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I'm a network engineer by trade, uh, and I've been doing that uh, probably something over over 20 years now. Um, started out with uh, a small Wisp out in uh, the rural parts of Colorado before DSL and cable had penetrated, and, and helped build that. Um, kind of figuring things out as we went, uh, and kind of parlay that into bigger and bigger networks, and then. Uh, spent some time at Cable Labs doing R&D for the cable industry and some time with the Internet Society flying around the world and talking about technology. Which is where um, you and I first got to know each other, I believe. It is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, between those two, I started going more to the IETF and, and a lot more events globally. And, and yeah, I met a lot of folks. So I was really lucky on, on a lot of that front. Um, and when I stopped, I realized how much of my life was being paid for by expense account, um, <laughs> which which was a, was a shock to my wallet, for sure, because I had elevated my lifestyle a little bit um, yeah. based on all the travel. Um, now I'm on my own. I do a lot of consulting. I have a couple uh, companies that I help out with and I'm helping to build, um, including Full Control, which is all about interconnection automation. Um, I also do a little podcast called the Imposter Syndrome Network, which we talk about careers and, and lessons learned through technology careers. Um, and yeah, and then did this survey, which I just presented uh, at Nanog uh, a few weeks ago in, uh, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, where this show originated. I was there and listened to your uh, to your survey results at Nanog, and uh, thought, "Wow, we got to get Chris on the Nerd Show uh, to to talk about uh, the the survey was about the state of network automation." Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, I mean, so um, just to kick things off, I mean, maybe we should. Maybe it's a, a good idea to to maybe just define. Everybody sort of knows what automation is, but uh, but then when you start really talking to a lot of people that aren't very involved in in automation, it's surprising how many people don't know the difference between you know really a, a DIY orchestration uh, suite versus just you know simple Ansible scripts. Uh, they don't understand the difference between. Just you know, automating simple tasks in the network as opposed to orchestrating uh, the man full management of your network. And I don't think any of us are there for managing the full the full network yet. But uh, I haven't seen one yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody. I mean, you know, I'm I'm with uh, uh, with Abstra. Jeff used to be with Abstra. Um, you know, and even there, you know, we're. That product only focuses on data center. It certainly right. you can't use that to automate everything in your network. Um, Which was an important thing. You cannot be anything to everybody, right? You exactly. need to focus on your core knowledge and really dive into properly automate and orchestrate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, trying to think of uh, where a good place to start is in this, but... Uh, well, maybe uh, we're but talking through a couple of those pieces there, because I, I think the same thing, and I actually recently did kind of um, um, 
uh, I don't know, I guess you'd call it research, just kind of, you know, going across and kind of get this stuff straight in my own mind, because, you know, the, even just automation and orchestration, what's the difference there? I mean, that, that was, you know, a troublesome thing to kind of tease out for me at, at the beginning. And, and then, you know, as uh, I think you misspoke at the very beginning and said, you know, the state of network operations right. instead of state of network op automation, but there really are that like, maybe not quite the same thing, but I mean, that was, that's what network automation is all about is, is operating your network. Absolutely. Um, and so understanding how this stuff fits together, I think, you know, to me anyway, and maybe this is debatable, but, you know, automation is essentially delegating a task to a bot, right? You're, you're getting yeah. some kind of computer code usually um, to do some task, um, whereas orchestration is then kind of automating the automation. So you've got all these tasks that you need done, and now you've got an orchestration tool that's, that's you know, doing this ta tasks in the right order. Um, so you're delegating more of the work um, in kind of a more substantial way. Yeah, I mean, and be, being a uh, music nerd, uh, music fan, I guess I should say, Jeff is is more of a, a real musician. But, um, uh, you know, I, I go to symphonies all the time and, and you know, just maybe obvious and stupid um, parallel is, yeah. you know, when you're looking at an orchestra, the conductor is making sure that every different aspect every musician is on the same note and the same uh, uh you know and creating something that's really amazing out of small pieces and and certainly that's what orchestration is doing too with networks i agree and then i think it's important though that you to go a little bit beyond that right and i think there are uh, you know aspects of, of observability and kind of what that means and how it differs from monitoring that's important and then that ties really closely into validation um, yeah. and I think observability and validation are different, but very related. Um, so to me, you know, monitoring is looking for known unknowns or even known knowns, right? You, you know that you want to look at your interface stats. You know that if the CPU gets too hot, it's going to be a problem, uh, yeah. you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can kind of look for these things. Whereas, you know, from my perspective anyway, observability is a lot more about those, you know, unknown unknowns, which is, you know, something happened. We didn't expect it to happen. And we need to figure out why it happened or even know that it happened at all. We're not watching for it because we didn't expect it to happen. Um, so you kind of got to be watching everything um, to see what happens. And, you know, observability is a term that's been getting really popular in since software development, you know, in the last maybe maybe even 20 years. It probably goes back pretty far. Um, really understanding um, kind of the state of the system from the user's perspective is, is I think a lot of the way that you want to look at it. And so in networking, there's kind of two ways to look at that. One is um looking at um traffic right you, you can get observability by saying okay where are the bits going and where are they coming from and how is all that working i think that's one way to get good observability in a network another way is to look at the state of the devices um yeah. and understand you know how they're configured and then how they're operating as well um and and looking at it that way and maybe maybe you need both to really get true observability but there's two kind of ways to go there and then validation is a piece of that which is understanding specifically that the devices are configured and operating properly, um, which yeah. is, I think, a subset of this overall observability of how the system actually works. Which you would... if you rephrase that you would like to make your observability actionable to close the loop. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. That, exactly right. Right. That's I think that's where we start going is when we start talking about automation from like a control systems theory. You're looking at yeah, open loop versus closed loop, and the only way to close that loop is to have the observability and validation connect back to the automation. Right. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, kind of going into your study a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are your conclusions about the state of automation in the industry right now? Yeah. So um, it, it's interesting. And I do want to put some caveats on this because, you know, I, it, I'm definitely I'm not a statistician or, or an academic researcher. And so, I, you know, we have to take a little bit of grain of salt here um, for a couple of reasons. One. People who answered the survey definitely self-selected a little bit. Um, we had 78 responses, which is pretty good. I, I want to get that up with the next version. We're going to do another one um, for next year, I think. Um, and I I'd like to see that a lot higher. So hopefully people listening here can, can you know, lock that away in their heads and look for it in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, out of those 78 folks, we did get some really good diversity, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there was 20 different countries represented, although most of it was the U.S. and and uh, and Canada, which, which makes sense. I'm an American, and I announced it at Nanog and, and on the Nanog list and things like that. Um, there was 14 different types of organizations represented, um, nine different roles or, or job functions of the people who were answering, and and a pretty wide range of of scale of networks. So we, I think we got a pretty good sample size. But again, you know, it's definitely not 
perfectly representative of, of every network on the planet and things like that. Um, and, you know, the, the big takeaways were that, you know, at least according to the folks who answered, um, about 40% of the networks, um, or of the, of the entire network is automated. And, and, and that's interesting, right? So what we were looking at was, you know, not is, is network A automated and network B not automated, but what percentage of network A is automated and what percentage of network B is automated and then kind of averaging that out. So the, the median was about 40%. Of, of networks being automated. Again, I, I feel like that's a little high and probably because of the folks who answered, um, if, if, if people weren't doing any automation at all, I assume they didn't answer a network automation survey, um, which is the one fault we have here a little bit, I think. Um, yeah. but, but within that, right, of these folks that are you know, mostly not automating, and we see this on the next number, right? So of the respondents, um, 90% said they were doing some kind of homebrew, right? They're writing their own scripts. They're, they're doing some kind of development internally. They're, they're building something. Um, and 80% said they were using open source software, um, which is pretty huge. Only less than 31% said they were using some kind of commercial automation software package. Um, and so again, one thing that this shows is the fact that 90% of the respondents are doing some kind of homebrew means that to me anyway, almost you know, anybody who's not doing automation didn't answer the survey, which, which you know, as we said, it's kind of skews the results a little bit. Um, but you know, it's interesting, right? That there's a definitely right now a heavy skew towards open source software and, and kind of building it yourself versus these commercial tools. Now, this obviously doesn't come from the survey, but my thoughts on that are that, you know, we've got these legacy heterogeneous built up over time networks that it's really hard to snap in a tool, as we talked about earlier, to do everything for everyone. And so you yeah. almost have to do some customization at, at some level. This 90% homebrew, does that Anywhere in the survey, uh, do you differentiate between people that say, yeah, we have homebrew uh, automation, but what they really mean is, well, we got some engineers out there running Ansible scripts that, you know, they're throwing a few things together, uh, as opposed to people that are significantly operating their network uh, with with automation tools. Yeah. And proper software development or kind right. of yeah. tool sets. So the proper software development I didn't ask about. It's probably worth doing in a future version. As far as you know, what things folks are automating, um, I think we can get a little bit of an, an answer here. So the, the math, this is weird math here, and I'll explain it a little bit. So the first numbers so on the top line, there are 26. That's folks who said that they had device deployment um, fully automated. Mm -hmm. And 32, uh, no, not, sorry, not 26%, 26 individual respondents said, we, we, you know, we're, we've, got, uh, we've got device deployment fully automated. 32 said it's partially automated. So the total was 58. The reason I spelled it all out was because you know, I didn't check to see if any of the people in the 32 were also in the 26. And so that may not actually be 58 of 78. It may be a lesser number, but uh, that's kind of how it shook out. So, you know, and I, I kind of stack ranked these device deployment service provisioning firmware upgrades, you can see the list all the way down here on kind of, you know, top to bottom as far as what was the most automated individual tasks. Um, but I didn't ask about, you know, are you using a source of truth? Are you doing design based automation? Uh, you know, do, are you really using CICD and, and checking stuff in and out and um, all, all that as far as how the automation is? So, you know, to your point, even the device deployment stuff, it could be somebody has a shell script or an expect script running to, to do device uh, deployment. Um, yeah, so, so the sophistication isn't isn't covered here. Yeah, and I'm I'm actually very interested the uh, uh, that last uh, uh, the last statistic in there on network design, which yeah. uh, uh, one of the things that leads into you know something that Jeff and I have talked about a lot in the past is is uh, you know is differentiating uh, uh, the automation of design, build, and operations. You know, obviously, most people are going to think about operations. That's kind of where we talk about, too. But, you know, you can also automate uh, your network design. You can automate your uh, your build process, uh, you know, for first bringing up, you know, a new network segment or where, whatever that might be, um, you know, beyond the operations where, you know, you really think about, you know, your day to day. And sorry, I'm. Be, being in the data center world, you know, I kind of gravitate to that. But, you know, things like like uh, uh, deploying virtual networks or removing virtual networks and deploying VRFs and that sort of thing. But also, you know, then monitoring those, 
uh, troubleshooting those when things go wrong, you know, sort of lump all those, uh, doing analytics on your network, you know, mm -hmm. when you have questions about your network and want to know, how, you know, and, and so all of that is really lumped into operations, you know, but, but the day zero, day one stuff, you know, design and build um, can certainly fall under, under automation. So yeah. I would think that the ability to go higher in abstraction layer is directly related to software development capabilities of organization, right? If you start with network design, it's pretty high level of abstraction, right? So you're really translating business logic into high level implementation. And below, yeah. so you've got all this uh, really, how do you take high level business logic and translate it into IP address, VLAN, VRF, or any other building blocks. And this is from software development where it becomes really complicated. And again, and after we've seen really well how much work goes into it. And you really need software development of uh, reasonably high class to actually do it properly. Yeah. Well, that's certainly the biggest problem with, with the, the, the homebrew, as, as I called it in the survey anyway, uh, approach is in most cases, right, this is, yeah, one or two or maybe even a small group of engineers who get together and put something together. Um, and they're they're not developers by trade. And so, you know, and that doesn't mean that their code will be bad necessarily. Um, but what it probably means is their maintenance practices may not be up to snuff. And, and even yeah. if they do maintain their code very well, there's a very good chance they'll move on to other teams or other companies at some point, And you end up with this stranded code. Uh, which I think is, you know, one of the nightmares of automation, which is yeah. potentially one of the reasons why folks may shy away from some automation practices because they've gotten burned in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's some managers out there who, you know, had somebody leave and had a script that went haywire after they were gone and, and didn't know what to do with it. And, um, and now, you know, think that that's a bad word. Uh, you know, I have yeah, it's that. sort of that, that awkward uh, stage between just, as you said, just having a couple of guys that, have uh, you know that are adept at Python or or whatever, and and have developed these scripts, as opposed to companies that have matured enough to have uh, you know a, a, a full time DevOps organization, you know, or you know, and, and there's obviously a lot of companies out there that just can't afford to have a full time DevOps organization. Absolutely, we did ask some questions about. Um the staffing and things here. Let me see if I find that. Um, and, and this is kind of a, it's definitely not a one-to-one -one comparison. This is, this is a little bit of apples and oranges, but just because I was talking mainly to the, you know, Nanog type crowd in, in the survey, um, I, I compared kind of interconnection to automation. And, and like I said, obviously they're totally different practices, um, but just looking at where folks are investing, um, the, the amount of staff actually came out fairly even for, for what people are dedicating to interconnection and what people are dedicating to automation, which I found interesting. I, I didn't expect to see that. Again, yeah, you know, this one the caveat that, you know, I think there was definitely a lot more folks doing automation that answered the survey. Um, and we may have missed a, a group of folks who aren't doing any automation, but uh, that was a, you know, what was nice. The thing that was interesting was the other side of that, which is just how much you're spending on automation, you know, outside of staff. And that was where automation definitely gets the short end of the stick. Uh, it looks like in people's budgets, um, you know, for for interconnection, you know, I, I, more than half of the folks um, uh, are spending over 10k a month on, on an interconnection. Now, again, not really apples to apples, but just as a, as a reference point. Whereas more than half of the folks who responded were, were spending less than a thousand dollars a month on automation, which I think a lot of that might be zero. Yeah. And does that take into consideration, I'm, I'm assuming that's something that is directly measurable, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, we, we can tell this, the, you know, these amount of dollars are earmarked for automation or whatever, but does it take into consideration just uh, man hours and that sort of thing? No, I don't think so. And, and again, there's a little bit up to the interpretation of who answered the survey. Um, yeah. but we did kind of ask, you know, staffing and, you know, spending separately. So I think, you know, maybe the man hours is taken up in the, in the staffing, but, but, but possibly a lot of it's not right. Because there may be folks who aren't automation engineers who are still spending time working on maintaining or dealing with, um, some of this, you know, open source or, or homebrew stuff. Yeah, because, you know, that's something that, uh, and again, you know, I want to be real clear. I'm working for 
a commercial automation product. So, you know, I may have my, I probably do have my, my own prejudices <laughs> there, but what seems to, to, uh, you know, one of the drivers that we see, uh, of, you know, well, why are you not just buying commercial automation, uh, products and, you know, you're doing your own and a big driver supposedly is, you know, well, it costs so, so much less, uh, mm. to do DIY, but, you know, the follow-up question always becomes, well, have you considered the man hours that goes into not just creating your own, uh, uh software, but maintaining it, which is a significant <laughs> effort. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely the big piece, I think, um, from my perspective, yeah. the, the maintenance of it, right? Yeah. And so, just, I was going to roll back a little bit. We talked uh, a, a little bit about kind of, you know, design versus operations and things. And, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, in, in the kind of, you know, what is automated uh, kind of question um, that I think, you know, was, was to me much lower on the list than it should have been is, is this troubleshooting. Yeah. Um, uh, from my perspective, read only troubleshooting type activities is where you should start with automation, especially if you're doing yeah. kind of homebrew stuff and just getting your toes wet. Um, you know, instead of going from switch to switch to switch and looking for that missing VLAN, you know, write a script to do that and, and get, you know, get familiar with the interfaces and, and how to work with it and how to use these tools. Um, or even if you're using a commercial tool, right, a lot of them will do this kind of thing, too, and show you kind of, you know, um, traces or walks through the network and where configurations are and show you configuration errors and things. And I really think it's a, a great entry point. Almost everybody goes directly to service provisioning or device deployment as, as their go-to. And so I'm, I'm not surprised that they're at the top of the list here. Um, but I, I wish more people would start with, with troubleshooting and, and kind of those, you know, day two, day three operations tasks that are read-only and therefore a little bit safer too. Yeah. And uh, the kind of byproduct of troubleshooting development, you're actually learning what your network is doing, what it's supposed to be doing. You learn the protocols, the states, it's direct investment into your knowledge and how good you are as a network engineer. Yeah. And for, for troubleshooting, you know, a, a term that everybody has heard, it's probably way overused, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's an important term is, is the idea of a single source of truth. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to troubleshoot and, and you mentioned, you know, going from device to device to device, but behind that, if there's software that's doing that, if there's automation, as opposed to you're triggering the automation, you know, and the, the, the information you might pull, uh, state information and that sort of thing, uh, telemetry and all of that from, from each device, um, you know, the, the question comes in for your, uh, software of how do you, how do you, uh, normalize, hmm. uh, that information, you know, if, if your state is different, uh, you know, or your telemetry is different on different devices, you know, which one is telling you the truth. Uh, yeah. Right. So how do yeah. you compare IS pass to a counter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent question. And then you think, you know, that's one of those places where in, in most cases, you know, as you pointed out, right, some of the commercial tools maybe that have a little bit more development time behind them can help out with. There is an open source package for, for specifically for state and kind of keeping time series data, uh, Suzy Q, that I've seen some folks have some good uh, success with, um, which is pretty interesting. That kind of does some of that normalization. It'll pull in a lot of state data, keep it in a time series database and let you kind of roll back and look at what the state was of, of an interface or, or CPU temp or, you know, whatever the thing might be and, and see how that, you know, changed over time. Um, across multiple different devices in, in heterogeneous environments, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the more complex on. question, really. So we usually refer to the state as uh, intended state. So what your network should be doing versus operational state, what's it doing? How do you establish intended state? How do you actually know what good state of your network is? And this is a yeah. real problem because as I said, operational state, we know high CPU is bad. Low memory is bad high utilization is bad. So we can somewhat assess based on kind of single unidimensional counters in a way, but mm -hmm. taking operational system, comparing it to something that we don't really understand what it should be is the real issue here. Hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, an important uh, capability there is being able to set thresholds, you know, because, you know, for whether it's memory utilization or uh, 
uh, bandwidth utilization or whatever, you know, each one of us say, if the three of us are running three different networks, we probably all have different definitions of, of what we consider, um, you know, borderline, a borderline anomaly or, you know, a, a borderline alert. And, you know, whatever automation you're, you're using, it's, it's important to be able to, to set thresholds that define so what funny, you expect to see. Yeah. Funny enough, it goes back into like this is all traffic engineering discussion. Do you throw more benefits as the problem or you try actually to optimize your net? Well, that's exactly the same set of problem, right? And most people yeah. prefer to throw more hardware or bandwidth on the problem. So keep your utilization below 30%, you know, even if there's a peak or failure, you'll still be able to kind of absorb it. But the cost associated is yeah. high. Yeah, exactly. And Chris, you, you mentioned uh, Susie Q. Um, yeah. Just in from in your observations of uh, uh, network automation, do you see uh, certain uh, open source tools becoming more popular than others? Or uh, I'm probably not stating that well, but uh, yeah, no, you're, definitely. You see tools that you would you personally recommend uh, people explore if they're if they're starting off automating their network. I do, and I, I can go to kind of some survey results here first, just to show a little bit of the wisdom of the crowd. Um, we asked about uh, what languages, what programming languages folks are using, uh, and you can see that Python is far and away the leader. Uh, yeah. There's still some shell scripts out there. There's still some Perl. Uh, some folks are using Golang or, or, or other um, tools. Whether or not Ansible is a language, I'm not sure, but it is getting used a little bit out there. Um, but, but definitely Python seems to be the, the tool du jour. And we've absolutely seen a lot of software libraries and things like that come up around Python. Um, so I, it, it, it's definitely what I use. Um, I, I do a combination of shell and, 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 and Python. Uh, I learned more in the shell. And so I still do a lot of set and awk and like data management of, of, you know, parsing configs around and things like that with, with shell scripts. But then I'll use that as input into Python. That's going to actually do any interactions with APIs and, and devices and things like that. Um, cause there's just so many libraries. It becomes really simple. I mean, you write a Python script and, and it look, you know, it's, it's maybe 10 lines and it does some really powerful things because you're calling on all these libraries that other folks have built up, um, before yeah. you kind of the, uh, the old standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, thing. Well, so it, it, strong net, network effect, right? Yeah. You, yeah. You use what other people did, people use what you did and all together create a lot of value. Well, I'll tell you something that makes me happy looking at these statistics is that, uh, that Ansible is kind of way you know certainly other things in there but but uh, i think somewhere early in the program i said something about you know people that view ansible as being an automation uh, uh tool you know which it obviously has its benefits you know but but by itself uh it doesn't offer all that much but seeing ansible this far down the list uh which probably means uh you know that it's being consumed by python uh, rather than as a standalone tool, uh, I think is a is a very positive thing. Well, you know, I don't want to I don't want to pop your bubble too badly, Jeff. But we did. We also <laughs> asked just generally what open source software folks are using. Uh, uh -huh. and Ansible was at the top of that list. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and also the source of truth things, right? Netbox and Nautobot were were numbers two and three, and then Norner, which I actually am starting to like a lot more than Ansible for for most network kind of automation tasks. Uh, came in there. Only five respondents, um, but in this survey that you know still landed at number four of the open source tools. This was a long tail of, yeah. of things here for sure. Um, but yeah, so so as far as you know what you know open source software in general, uh, Ansible did come out high here, and you can see some of the others. Yeah, um, I'm surprised NetMiko is is that far down the list. Yeah, uh, maybe yeah, only, yeah. I think all the historical reasons you see people using particular software and yeah yeah we're pretty interesting and you see you know some people even you know mentioned the python libraries here so python kind of got double mentioned just like just like ansible did on the languages and the open source side um yeah i'm surprised to see git so low it's such a useful tool to build cicd pipes and then automating your deployment practices yeah, and, and I'm curious about this, right? Because if you, if you notice, so of the 78 respondents, 76 answered the how is it being automated question, and then 60 answered the 
you know, open, oh, you know, how is it being automated with, with open source software question, um, which may mean, you know, so this may be something in the way I asked the question potentially, or, or may just be, you know, people on the spot filling out a survey, didn't think actually of, of all the tools they're using in their stack. Cause I am surprised too. Right. I mean, if you look, you know, um, as you mentioned, NetMiko only getting two, you know, responses and, and, you know, even, even not about NetBox, you know, 12 and five each. Um, that, I mean, I guess that could be accurate, but I, I feel like there's a, a wider deployment out there of, of some of these tools. Um, Git for sure. Uh, seems like, yeah. you know, a lot of folks would be using it uh, in some way, shape or form, but maybe not thought of it on the spot when they're filling out the survey. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it could it be that it's, I mean, based on just the way the question is here, could it be more that, you know, get is, is way down on the list just because they're look, uh, you know, looking at it specifically for automation as opposed to, you know, repositories and that sort of thing. Right, just general software maintenance or software development yeah. tools. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think that's possible for sure. So, so you have things to work on there. Um, and then, you know, and for me, I mean, you know, I would echo a lot of this, right? So like I said, I, I write in Python. Um, mm -hmm. NetBox and Nautabot are both used in, in different projects that I'm using. Um, Ansible has been a big part of, of the toolbox, right? It's, it's, you know, maybe the screwdriver or the hammer. I don't know which one it is, but it's in there in the toolbox for sure. But I've been slowly replacing it with Norner uh, in a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, places. Yeah. So Chris, you're a consultant. How does your engagement look like? So you come first time and you've got a lot of data. You've got a lot of experience as a network engineer, as a software developer. How do you drive your engagement with your customers? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's a pretty typical kind of consultation process. Um, and, and as you talked about, right, I mean, just like in the network, you have kind of your intended state and your actual state a lot of the things I try to work out with a customer really early on is, you know, what does this ideal state look like? Where are we trying to go? And then doing a really in-depth, you know, look at where you actually are, right? So, so kind of current state and ideal state, and then mapping out that path to get there and figuring out, um, you know, based on individual requirements, objectives, and constraints for each customer, there's usually some kind of stair step of, you know, figuring out what's the lowest impact to either your users or your customers, depending on what kind of company I'm working with. Um, you know, and, and, you know, what's the right order of operations to get through this? Where do we start? Where do we want to end and, and, and kind of work through that? But I think, you know, there, there's two pieces, right? One is, is that really honest understanding of, of where you are today. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, in a lot of cases, nobody's quite as worse off as they think they are. Um, but in some ways, everybody's more you know, worse off than they, than they think they are. There's definitely, you know, both of those things going on in, in most networks, um, just because again, the way networks grow is, has been, um, you know, people do things their own way and then either personnel changes or the mission changes and they do things a little bit different way. And you get kind of these layers, I guess, technical debt is, is a common term for, for some of this. And that definitely happens in the network. Yeah. You get different types of devices over time. You get, you know, maybe somebody wrote some scripts for this one part. And then again, they, maybe they quit and those scripts are still running. So nobody touches them, you know, don't, don't move the, the matchbox under the stool kind of stuff. Um, but the other piece, uh, other than just kind of, you know, a real honest assessment of where you are and, and then from there being able to figure out what to build on, the other piece is definitely cultural. Um, I think there is absolutely some resistance to automation, um, whether it's conscious or subconscious among a lot of folks um, and, and just shifting kind of how you operate your network, especially when you're talking about kind of what I think of as, you know, kind of true modern networking and network operations is using this source of truth. And starting to shift, you know, making changes in the source of truth and letting the automation make changes in the network and not going out and making changes in the network, um, you know, trusting your 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 um, visibility panels, you know, your network management, network, network observability um, tools and and not, you know, immediately going out and making changes in the network on the devices themselves directly is, is a hard habit to break, I think. And so, um, you know, trust in the tools is, is a big part of this as well. And I think that's often a, as big a part of the consulting engagement as the actual technical work is, is getting folks to, to use it, to trust it, um, and to get familiar with, with kind of this new way of networking, which, um, you know, it depends on who you are, right? If, if, you, if you work at like a born in, in the cloud company and you've never touched real infrastructure, it's an easy transition. Uh, if you're used to working on, you know, AWS or Azure or GCP, uh, moving to NetBox or Nautobot, um, and that kind of interface is, is pretty easy. But if you've spent, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years working on uh, a CLI, it's, it's a much bigger shift. 
Do, do you encounter a lot of resistance within your customers of simply, you know, going along to the last thing you said, uh, people that don't really understand uh, Python or, you know, scripting or whatever. They've been, you know, CLI jockeys all their lives and they see automation as a threat to their jobs um, and, you know, and kind of put the brakes on because of that. Do you, do you encounter much of that? Yeah, I th yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, and it's usually more subtle than, you know, nobody's scout yeah. screaming, you know, pry the CLI out of my cold, dead hands, usually. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I think it's a lot like I've been reading recently about the second industrial revolution when kind of the U.S. surpassed the U.K. and we kind of took over global trade in a lot of ways. And there's, you know, steel and railroads and and stuff like that. And, and the 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 factory and the assembly line came to yeah. the United States. This is like 1850s ish. And one of the things that's interesting that marked that time period is, you know, industrialization in that context was really a move from individual artisans um, mm -hmm. to, you know, mass produced things. Yeah. And, and, and it creates huge efficiencies for the overall economy. Um, but obviously the individual artisans don't necessarily love it. And, and, and reasonably so, right? So the person who spent years, you know, training a craft of, um, you know, filing down parts on, a, on, on, you know, whatever piece of equipment they, you know, were, were crafting by hand and, and assembling that. And now you've made that an assembly line um, thing. It, it doesn't feel great, right? To, 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 you know, it feels a little marginalized that this skill you've built over a, a career of, of, you know, years or decades um, now isn't as important as it might have been before. And so I think it's totally natural to have some reluctance and some resistance there. Um, because in a lot of ways, you know, network automation can make things easier. I think the key is to realizing that, you know, instead of handcrafting every part, you can now shift out and have a little bit bigger systems view, a little bit more architectural view, a view to kind of new things, new protocols, new advancements, new ways to build the network. Um, and, and once you make that shift, I think most people are, are, are all on board because there's not less work to do by any stretch. Um, in a lot of cases, there's actually more work to do. So your job's not going away, but it does change. And I think that's just as scary. Yeah, the, the the example I use probably far far more often than I should uh, was a study I read several years ago uh, where uh, pilots of Boeing 777s said that they spend on average um, about seven minutes actually manually flying the plane <laughs> yeah. and uh, the rest of it is automated. And, you know, that doesn't mean that we're on the verge of taking pilots out of the cockpit. It right. actually improves their job because with less distraction over the mundane uh, tasks of flying the plane, they're able to focus more on the overall mission of the plane and, you know, more aware of weather and what's going around, on around them, you know, around them in terms of airspace and all of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, really is allowing pilots to apply their expertise better uh, uh, to, to the flight. And, um, you know, and I, I like to point to, you know, the same thing is true of network automation. You know, your, your job isn't going away. You're able to use your expertise better instead of just putting out fires. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, Chris. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> when you go to customers, very early in engagement, you're asking them about pain points. Would you rank like three or five most common ones and how they're perceived yeah. by, by people? Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. So I think um, yeah, that's a good question. So definitely, I mean, so I don't know one, two, three, four. I don't know if these are actually in order, but I think, you know, up, up in that top bubble, you know, mistakes are, are a huge one. And yeah. maybe, maybe that is number one, but uh, it's really easy to fat finger something. It's really easy to to miss eye something, especially if you're in a maintenance window at 3 a.m. Uh, or you're getting a trouble call, you know, at 4 a.m. And um, and and so you know that's one of the things too that you know automation isn't just you know it's not it's not taking away the configuration tasks from you. It's it's structuring them right and it's building policy into the process. And so uh, if it's done right, it, it should actually make it a lot harder to make a mistake. Um, yes. Just programmatically, um, but anyway, so 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 removing that human error and human mistakes. I, I don't know because I think uh, eighty three percent of statistics are made up on the spot, <laughs> but I believe it's something like seventy percent of network outages are caused by you know a, a configuration error, right? It's it's literally yeah. we're doing something and we we messed it up and we cause an outage. Um, I, I, I get the same thing, and I mean literally for the last, uh, you know, 
20 or uh, 25 years that I've been standing in front of audiences talking about various aspects of network operations. And somewhere in there, I'll throw in something about, you know, that depending on the study you look at, anywhere from 60% to 80% of network outages or anomalies are, are caused by human error. And, you know, I always get a lot of nods from the audience, <laughs> yep. you know, so. Well, and, and we all I mean, have the stories like <laughs> debug BGP and then driving for four hours to the router and who didn't do that. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, or you switch from Juniper to Cisco and you type S-H-I-N-T and then uh, uh, you yeah. got problems. Um, and, and there's a reason that, you know, service providers do change freezes over the holidays. Because it's less work for everybody. Well, why is that? Because changes, if people are in there mucking about, stuff breaks, right? When, when people leave the thing alone, it tends to hum along on its own pretty well. Uh, yeah. I mean, there are, obviously, there are hardware failures you know, from time to time, and, and there are security risks and things like that. But the rest of it's us doing stuff. So that's a big one. And then you know, the other piece is, is really just, well, maybe it's two pieces, but there's you know, scale and there's agility are, are, are big things, right? So you know, more and more and more, um, networking and networks are becoming, you know, they even more foundational to business and to organizations, right? I mean, you just because you know because computers and and software and applications and all the stuff we're doing is, is ingrained almost now. I mean, almost every business has some key dependency on some software somewhere, which yeah. in turn means that they have some key dependency on on a network somewhere as well, and. And those networks are becoming more complex, right? Whether it's, you know, adding IoT to like factories and logistics and, and hospitals and a lot of places are adding a ton of devices to networks that just makes the network really, really big um, and, and more complex. Um, or, you know, the other side is, you know, the network's got to adapt to, okay, well, we're adding a new service. And so now we need a new connection here. And, we're, you, know, there, you know, there's innovation happening and, and cloud on ramps and, there, you know, different things happening there. So, you know, between scale and, and feature creep, I think being able to keep up uh, is just something where they can't hire fast enough, right? Again, I don't think there's jobs going away. I think there's jobs being unfilled and potentially automation can help us kind of bridge that gap a little bit um, if, if, you know, if you build that in. So, I mean, those are definitely the big ones, right? The mistakes and just keeping up, I think, are kind of the two top ones. Um, and almost anything else can be sorted into one of those two categories, but there's definitely usually, you know, hey, we're spending all this time doing this, you know, this task, um, you know, can we get rid of that task kind of thing? You know, but, but again, it kind of falls into the efficiency pieces and things like that. Um, you know, we just can't keep up in a lot of cases. Chris, do you have numbers of how we gather the states and telemetry? Um, no, so I From didn't ask as much about to... the observability stuff. Yeah, I think that's probably something that I missed and we need to put in the next uh, version is asking about the observability side of it, not just the automation side. Um, yeah. yeah. Let me say the same I mean, question differently. You go to customers, you, yeah. you go to people, right? So you see, look, what do you see? Compare like syslog, GNMI, screen scraping. I mean, all usual yeah. stuff. Yeah. What so, I mean, it, it's still a ton of SNMP. Uh, it, it, that's, that's definitely still the de facto standard out there. Um, <laughs> one of the things I often get brought <laughs> in to do uh, is uh, early 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things I often get brought in to do is actually move over to like a, a, a gRPC, GNMI type interface, get streaming telemetry going, lower the burden on the devices from having. That's the other thing too, right? Big networks end up, not just that SNMP is kind of old and, and crusty, but it's it's resource intensive. And what often happens, especially at service providers, but also at big enterprises, is you keep adding more and more monitoring observe, you know, systems and things like And so then you've got like three, four, five, six things that are all pulling SNMP on devices. And uh, they don't love that those devices. Right. They don't they don't like like being being smacked you know every five minutes by ten different systems. Uh, so then just switching over to something like GNMI and getting streaming telemetry and going through something like you know Grafana, Prometheus, InfluxDB stuff like that, and and actually you know kind of modernizing that system is often a big big win uh, for a lot of folks. But yeah, usually it's starting yeah, so with SNMP in my experience. <laughs> Back to debug BGP, I still remember we had to fly from San Jose to to London to fix the SNMP problem with British Telecom in old good Redback days. They're just putting some BGP stuff and it would freeze whole device for like seven minutes. So yeah. Hey S N P. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um and then you know one more thing if I can bring up this was something that was interesting and I think I can do a better job of asking this question in the future. But I asked folks, you know, do you consider yourself a networking expert? 
do you consider yourself an interconnection expert? And then do you consider yourself an automation expert? And, and you can see it's pretty striking. It almost is reversed between networking and interconnection to automation where, you know, and, th and again, this is again, now that caveat I was making earlier about this group being a self-selected group who are mostly doing automation, they're still saying, no, I'm, I'm not an expert in automation, right? So there's a lot of folks out there doing this that don't feel necessarily qualified, you know, so that's that skills gap is, you know, according to this sample, 73% of these folks are uncertain of their automation skills. Whereas, um, you know, it's 65 and 58 were willing to say, yes, I'm an expert in, in the networking topics. Um, but only 27% were willing to say that on the, on the automation side. So there's definitely some work to be done. I think as far as, you know, getting folks up to speed on this stuff and getting them familiar with it, it's definitely not as widespread as we uh, would hope at this point. That's an interesting number. I mean, with 20 yeah. plus years experience in ATF, I've never been in a room with 65% networking experts. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's right, one, uh, of those, uh, one of those, uh, uh, the, more, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Yeah. Hey, Always. next question to you is, yeah. uh, uh, traditionally we've got like the silos between Several people, the networking mm -hmm. people that don't necessarily like each other, and we see more and yeah. more that you know you have to work together. There's no way around. And actually, cost of bit lost is going up, not down, with all the stuff that's going on with machine learning and all like database, all the kind of network bound applications. Networking is usually important, as you said. So, do you see the kind of merge? How people do interact with each other? Yes and no. I, 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 there's a lot of variation. Um, there's still a lot of silos. I mean, there's definitely, um, you know, a customer I'm working with um, very recently anyway, um, where even within the networking team, there was two teams and, and we had to kind of balance between the two. And, and honestly, like our, our, in our consulting with them was a lot of like, it seemed like our calls with the customer were the only times that these two teams talked to each other. Like we actually like extended our calls to allow them to like share information because, you know, we needed to know what was going on on both sides to be able to make the whole system work. Um, but there was two different sets of requirements going on because, you know, one was focused on, on one thing and one was focused on another thing. So there's definitely still a lot of that out there. Um, I, you know, but there are companies that are doing really, really well that have really flat hierarchies and really flat technical teams and, and kind of have folks kind of bouncing around and talking to each other and, and doing things. So, you know, I, you know, as, as an overall industry, where are we? I, I don't know. I think there's still a lot of silos and a lot of, of groups that are kind of really insular and, and, and don't work outside of that group. Um, hopefully there's some good managers at least bridging those groups together, but um, it's definitely still a problem. I, I think I think it's getting better. Um, but, uh, but like I said, you know, and then when you bring security into it as well, that's another piece where, um, you know, some organizations have adopted that security is, is something that needs to be done like as part of your normal work. Uh, and some still kind of wall it off as the as the no team that comes along and just smacks everybody. So, yeah, nobody likes working with security because uh, <laughs> yeah, and so security by security. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question to you. So we see proliferation of Kubernetes and uh, similar networking primitive, which changes networking significantly, right? It's mm -hmm. pure routed layer two just doesn't exist. Do you see this kind of changes in networking? I know we moved from spanning three to routing one time ago, but it still doesn't mean that we are kind of endorsing layer three as the kind of foundational layer of technology, not something that runs on top. Do you see this change in mentality and thinking? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And it actually kind of triggers me back to the last question, which is, you know, that's an environment where I think I have seen a lot more flattening in organizations that are really deep into Kubernetes and building applications and things like that. You almost have to understand the network in order to, you know, build these really fragmented microservices, you know, um, type applications, because, you know, at that point, the network is the application in, in, in some ways, right? Or at least it's inside the application. Um, and so that's definitely an area, you know, folks who are doing that kind of development work. I, I do see, you know, more of that kind of flattening where, you know, the the storage people and the compute people and, and the developers and the network are, you know, maybe they're all, you know, uh, skill sharing, at, at least, if not quite, you know, the same team. Um, and, and I do think that, that, yes, I think that it has had an impact, right? I mean, that's one of the things I think, in general, maybe not totally consciously, but, you know, just 
even outside of the Kubernetes environment itself, but but the fact that we're building these things often in cloud environments and, and often in multiple cloud environments, and then we've got SaaS providers also coming in. It, it's really interesting to me how even the WAN has changed quite a bit because of this stuff, because um, interconnection now has become a, a really kind of big piece of, of all of this, tying it all together, where what I mean is, you know, you used to be able to maybe kind of have your LAN, you know, inside of your office, maybe you connect over a WAN to your data center and then have an internet connection from there. And, and now it's like, okay, well, no, AWS is actually part of my network. And, um, uh, you know, what is Slack, Slack or, or whatever it is, you know, is, is part of my network in some ways. And so, and so connecting all that stuff together, definitely, um, you know, BGP used to be a four letter word at a lot of enterprises. And, and I think that's slowly starting to shift where interconnection is becoming a bigger, bigger part of, of people's view at the macro level. And then definitely at the micro level, I think, you know, it's still a very small minority in, in my experience of folks who are really deep working in Kubernetes. But but of those folks, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's definitely driving a, a renewed understanding and interest in, in networking in, in different places and in different ways. Do you see multi-cloud playing into this? Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and that's part of what I think, you know, and here's the thing, right? It depends on what we how we define the term multi-cloud. I think from a networking perspective, almost everybody's multi-cloud already. Um, you know, you're, you're con like, again, you know, right now we're using StreamYard um, and I've got, you know, this connection to Google Drive over here. I mean, literally just this this call right now is multi-cloud in, in some ways, right? We're, we're combining data and, 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 and communications from multiple clouds. So at the network level, I think multi-cloud is absolutely reality. Whether or not you actually have some kind of um, what are folks, folks calling it, like the super cloud where you've got this interface and you have one dashboard to kind of control all the clouds. If that's what you mean by multi-cloud, that's, you know, different and maybe a little bit off. But from networking perspective, I think we're there and we need to deal with that reality of, of how do we actually, you know, control and work with all of these networks that we don't actually control, um, but tie them together into our network for our, you know, organization. Now, so if you do it, doing it over the top, it's kind of internet takes care of delivery, right? I'm more talking about when you explicitly try to route some stuff to AWS versus Google, you need to understand the semantics. It brings very different kind of context into automation, right? Level at abstraction, you automate and stuff. So do you see something like that? Um, absolutely. And yeah, and, and, and different ways of, of kind of flattening that out, right? You know, a lot of cases, you know, of seen folks just kind of, you know, come in and, and put in, you know, VPN devices in, in multiple clouds and kind of connect those together and back, also back into their own network, um, which has come a long way. I mean, there's definitely some some better kind of protocols and, and applications now for doing that kind of VPN stuff that work pretty well. Um, at the, on the other side, there is still all the same problems that everyone's ever had with like SSL VPN or not um, with SSH VPNs um, and, and connecting from, you know, from two different devices from two different manufacturers, still a problem. Uh, you know, however many decades later, uh, that still doesn't work very well. But but if you can, you know, put you know your same OS everywhere and, and connect it up that way, that's definitely pretty popular. Um, but usually, it's some mix, right? And that's what I mean. You know, I think you know some of these things you're you're accessing over the internet. Some you may be you know doing some kind of VPN. Some you may be doing some kind of direct connection. So using their VPN essentially, um, and then mixing all that together, and, and maybe you're using some kind of SD WAN provider. To get out to your, you know, your your folks who are working from home or from branch offices, and so um, you've definitely got this kind of mix of clouds that have to be connected together and in, in, in different ways. And I think um, I think that reality is still setting in as far as how to deal with that. But from automation perspective, and you being kind of the expert, this is probably where next, and maybe not next, maybe even current. Golf of optimization and automation is going to come to it's not just automating villains anymore it's right. automating connectivity to different places with different semantics different security policies so how are you dealing with this absolutely well so you know one of the things i've done is is you know on purely on bgp and interconnection itself i'm working with um a guy named grizz matt griswold who uh is the architect behind peering db and several other pretty internet uh, tools. And, and we're building a, a company and a software suite specifically aimed at interconnection. Um, and, and I think that's part of the answer is it, not, not you know, our company's not the answer, but, but looking at these problems in isolation, right? Um, kind of that Unix philosophy of doing one thing and doing it really, really well. I think that some of the problems that we've seen with you know, automation in general is, as we talked about at the very beginning of the show, is trying to be everything to everyone just doesn't quite work. You can't have at least today, you can't have one automation platform that's just going to do everything for you. It, it just doesn't work. 
Um, but you can string together a number of, of, of pieces that make sense and then orchestrate them together somehow, right? And, and that's where kind of some of the special sauce comes in. And that's a lot of the work I do is figuring out what's the best tool to do this job and this job and this job. And then how do we actually make them work together in a way that's sane and coherent, right? Yeah. It's pretty cool. And I believe you are very successful at this. So people should listen more to you and actually learn <laughs> how you're doing it. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're, I was just looking at, it looks like we've got uh, five minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, uh, so maybe this is a, um, a good time to start wrapping up. I personally, I think we could go another hour talking about this is, awesome. uh, we're definitely going to invite you back, Chris. Uh, Fantastic. Um, yeah, cause, cause I find this is fascinating and, but uh, you know, for maybe a, it, as far as wrap up, um, you know, obviously I think there's a lot of people that uh, are, you know, one of the big blockers for automation is simply as, as you showed in that one slide is, you know, we just don't feel like we have the expertise, mm -hmm. you know, and we can't necessarily afford to hire the expertise, whether it's, right. you know, an independent consultant like you or, or, you know, building that internally and, you know, plus the risks of, of, uh, um, uh, guys, as you cited early on, you know, building some automation and they go off somewhere and nobody else and nobody understands the software. Um, what are uh, some good ways for people to get up to speed and create more confidence about automation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, as always, kind of the the home lab and or 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 now cloud lab or whatever um, is is pretty crucial. I think you know, at least for me, anyway. I mean, different people learn different ways, but but for me, like having an actual problem to solve is is definitely how I've learned all these things. Um, through, you know, and luckily, you know, the world is very different than it was when I started out doing networking. You know, in in the early two thousands, when I was trying to you know use Linux to build routers. Um, we were on our own, right? We, you know, I, I got lucky to meet a couple of people who knew some things and, and, and got through it today. You know, there's YouTube videos, there's, there's stack overflow, there's chat GPT. Um, there's actually lots of resources out there that are pretty easy to kind of find and consume. And if, if you have a problem you're working on and you're trying to work through it and you start asking, you know, the internet or even the AI kind of what, you know, what's the best way to do this? There's a lot of answers out there. So it's a lot easier yeah. and more accessible if you're willing to kind of, you know, go read the manual, uh, as we used to say, um, but now that's, you know, online and pretty accessible to everyone. So that's definitely a place to start. Um, and, and then on this overall question, uh, if I can mention, you know, one of the things I've been asking myself for a long time is, you know, why haven't we deployed more network automation? And, and we talked about some of the answers here today. Um, but me and a colleague, Scott Roban, who I think is going to be on your show soon, yep. um, yes. have put together a group we're calling the Network Automation Forum. And we're planning to put on our first uh, event, uh, probably like a day and a half, two day conference in, in Denver in November uh, called AutoCon. AutoCon Zero will be this first one. And really, we're, we're, we're tagline it as, you know, this is the first conference that dares to ask the question, why isn't network automation fully deployed yet? Um, and so we want to dive into this, right? And we want to look at both the business drivers and the technical drivers. And this is one thing, Jeff, you and I obviously share a, a history in IPv6 adoption and trying to push that forward. And one of the things that, you know, as a young person, when I was really gung ho trying to tell people that they had to deploy IPv6 because they needed to, because it was the right thing to do, I learned somewhere along the way that, you know, at the end of the day, organizations have to follow the dollars that you have to, you know, yeah. like money makes, you know, money makes the, at least the enterprise world and business world go around. No way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, so I think, we, you know, same thing with network automation, right? We need to look at the dollars and cents of it and, and make sure yeah, that yeah. it makes sense there. Uh, as well as the technical challenges. So anyway, we're going to do that. Um, I think Scott will probably talk more about it. But, uh, you know, I think this is a conversation that I'm really glad you had me on to have. And I'd like to keep having as well. Yeah, we would love to have you back. And, you know, and, and, and that's, to me, I mean, one of, I can almost see that as a blocker uh, to automation of, you know, maybe I'm interested, you know, I really want to start automating more about my network, but there are so many tools out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you showed, you know, a whole long list. It's like, well, yeah. where do I start? What tools do I really focus on? And I think this kind of a forum where uh, uh, it's not just uh, people getting together and telling you about automation, but it's also just, uh, just uh, uh, gathering with a common interest. And being able to, you know, I've I've said this about Nanog forever that the most value, most value in my opinion about going to Nanog are the conversations you have in the hallways, um, and you know, hopefully that 
that forum, the automation forum, will become uh, very similar. You know, so you could start talking to to people who have a common interest of, well, you know, how are you starting? What are you know, what do you see as blockers? What you know, what are the things that you've uh, uh, hit the wall around? Um, so, looking yeah, forward to that. We, yeah. yeah, we might as a result get some informational best common practices idea right. for like draft people can read so i'm still i mean i'm not surprised i'm rather grateful to people i mean i was part of pushing the bgp and large gc there fc seventy nine thirty eight. there are yeah. literally hundred thousands of people who read it and implement their network accordingly right so yeah. this kind of document that is well written easy to understand easy to comprehend people enjoyed so much and used it so much in their daily work. So I'm really looking forward to similar documents coming from your work. Excellent. Yeah. Absolutely. I hope they're helpful. Well, Chris, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And like I said, I'll, it probably won't be too long from now that I'll be bugging you to, to come back and, and uh, uh, do a follow-up show. Good deal. Uh, but uh, but uh, the Thanks, information Chris. today has been tremendous. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. It was great. Uh, it was great a joy. having you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks.